Good evening, friends, and welcome to another episode in Opera America's On Stage at the Opera Center. This is another remote edition while we are waiting to come back from the COVID crisis. We'll look forward to being with you in person soon from the National Opera Center, but happy nonetheless to continue this series of conversations today. You'll remember in the fall, we had a wonderful session with Stephanie Blythe uh, and are just so honored to have another great singer with us tonight. If you have ever laughed heartily in the theater, it's probably because this man has been on stage. He has earned rave reviews as a singer and as an actor. He's also received rave reviews as a human being. He is one of our favorite people whenever we see him at the National Opera Center. Uh, and I'm just so thrilled that uh, he's able to join us this evening. Please welcome Kevin Burdett. Kevin, hi, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Mark, thank you for having me. It is uh, it's a thrill and it's an honor. Well, as you probably know, I start every interview asking, who brought you to your first opera? I love that question. It's such a great question. Uh, and my, so I grew up, and I'm the youngest of five children, and so I, and my siblings before me all played musical instruments, took lessons, and so I grew up, as did I, so I grew up around classical music. I played in the Youth Symphony and Knox and Knox Youth Symphony Orchestra, but I did not go to the opera until I was a junior in high school, and interestingly, I think I actually took myself. Uh, I was interested in um, asking a young woman out in, in high school, and I thought, you know, I got to do something interesting. And so I looked at the local paper and found out what was going on um, in, uh, in Knoxville that weekend, and I saw that they were doing a Don Giovanni. I thought, aha, maybe that. And so I called up this young woman and said, hey, I have an extra ticket uh, to Don Giovanni, or probably said Don Giovanni, uh, this weekend at the opera, would you like to come? And so we went, uh, and that was my first opera experience. Interestingly, I think, uh, in that opera was my friend, Phil Cocorino, uh, a legend, legendary singing actor, uh, and I've sung many times with Phil. Um, and, and there's something interesting, I don't know, something fulfilling for me to know that my first opera experience was with, uh, ended up starring someone who later became a friend many years later. Well, I, I have several questions there. So what was your instrument when you studied a musical instrument? I played the viola. And all of the viola jokes are totally appropriate and apt. Like there's, no, yeah, it was, a, oh, third position is not my forte or, and, you know. Did, did like the family string quartet need a viola? Why, why viola? Because that's what my siblings before me have played. So that's the instrument that my parents owned. <laughs> I, I thought they were trying to put together. I thought they were trying to put together a string quartet you could take on the road. Wouldn't that have been smart? No, it, like the Von Trapp family singers, we were the Burnett family viola. I love it. Didn't, I love it. Didn't sell a bunch of tickets. Now, so there you were, and you decided that you'd go to the opera. You like classical music, and you thought maybe you'd like this opera thing. That's absolutely right. Uh, and I, it turns out uh, I was right. And I, it, there's a story about that evening. The thing I remember most about that evening at the Tennessee Theater was I sat down. Uh, I was nervous, obviously, sweaty palm, because uh, I was on a date. And I opened the program. And in the program, I, I looked at uh, who was in the show. And one of the chorus members, a gentleman named Ed Patrick, was someone I had grown up near. His children and I had played sports together. And so I knew Ed very well. And something about that connection made me relax, made me comfortable, made me feel at home. It made me feel like I had a connection to the stage over the pit. And it's not like the chorus in Don Giovanni is a huge chorus, but just having that one connection on stage took away all of these presupposed barriers that were between me and this art form that I didn't know much about. And I think, I think about that often, even now, many years later, when I've been to more than one opera, uh, and how having that personal connection uh, it connects the audience with the with the people on stage, and all of a sudden, that story on stage is partly my story because it's partly Ed Patrick's story, and I'm a part of all that I have met, and I'm a part of his life. He's a part of my life. So somehow, 
I can, this story is my story too. It's really interesting how that personal connection just transforms the experience. And it, and it makes you feel that you're not in a strange place, but a place you belong. Absolutely right. That is absolutely right. How did the date go? Ah, you know, listen, we're still friends. Okay. <laughs> we ended up going to prom together. Uh, we weren't meant to be, Mark, if I'm going to be honest. We weren't meant to be. Does she still go to the opera? I reckon she does. You know what? I'll, I will ask her. I have, a, I, I, have a, I have a sneaky suspicion that she still goes to the opera. Because this was That's a great question. I love that question. This was an early investment in audience development. We have to see whether it paid off. Absolutely. Now, Ke Kevin, you, you, your repertoire, your performance resume is so varied. New works, works from the inherited repertoire, uh, works from the inherited repertoire in traditional productions in creative reinterpretations. I want to ask, what, what's the, what are the relative challenges of interpreting a role many have played versus creating a role no one has played? That's a great question, Mark. Um, I, I'm beginning to think I'm going to say that a lot. That's a great question. Um, I would say for... For for the standard for the, what you call the inherited the inherited repertoire, mm -hmm. that's a great way to say it. Uh, for the inherited repertoire, uh, you know, we have such a it's, opera is such a tradition rich art form, and I think the student of opera uh, must do a deep dive into uh, you know where we come from, whence we come, the shoulders on which we stand, uh, and what makes it difficult for me an in inherited repertoire is that I have. Uh, Sam Raimi's voice in my ear, and I have mm -hmm. the Ruto Prometo, the Itio Pinza, and Cesare Siepi all the way back. Uh, and so it's how do I make it my voice uh, and yet also honor that tradition? Uh, and in fact, it was really my work with new music. As you say, I've done, I've done a fair amount of, uh, a pretty a good amount of new music. Uh, and it, my work in new music was sort of a way I reverse engineered that because doing new music, of course, you're relieved of that burden. You're, I don't have uh, Raimondi's voice in my ear when I'm singing in mm -hmm. uh, Joby Talbot and Gene Shears' Everest. Um, and so I can just focus on Gene's text. Uh, and it helps, like I do, you know, I've done I've done Gene, a couple of Gene Shearer world premieres. I've done, you know, Terrence McNally words. I've done uh, I, these librettists, uh, Mark Campbell, these librettists. Uh, they write such compelling words and they, they leave a map for you into the character through those words. And you realize if I just deliver these words in my voice, then I'm telling the story. Then, of course, the onus for the new works is uh, you have, it's the onus of bringing it to life. Like you, you don't have the burden of hearing other voices, but then you have to you have to actually uh, bring that character to life. But finding your voice, like doing the new music, helped me find my voice. Helped me realize how I tell stories, and then now I can apply that to Labrello or Bartolo or to whomever. Uh, and realize it's not about manufacturing a sound per se. It's about figuring out how to how to tell. You, just like you say, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I just can't. I'm trying to think of what a good lyric from from Everest or "Bless You Ruby, the world goes round" from Cold Mountain. You can sing "Bless You Ruby" like that. You can also sing "Maravina." Look at all It doesn't have to be. This is the way it's supposed to sound. You know, uh, <laughs> speaking of new music, Jake Heggy uh, has that signature at the end of all his emails. That says that's an Oscar Wilde quote: "Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken." Yeah. And so it helps. It helps to realize, uh, yeah, man, I'd love to sound like Pinza or Siepi or you know, fill in the blank. All the people like Paolo Montarsolo or Andrew Wendell, the people who uh, Spiro Manas, the people who shape the way I think about music. But you know, Paolo Montarsolo is taken. You have to be yourself. I'm fascinated by how you talked about the librettists. So when you are taking on a role. Do you start with the words? Absolutely. I, I think it's very important for me to, to do the, to really get into the words and to repeat the words, of course, in a foreign language, to translate the words and to paraphrase the words and to emphasize different words in each sentence, to emphasize different words in each sentence, to emphasize different words in each sentence and feel it in each sentence and to figure out how each one plays and how each one informs uh, 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 you know, it's about, for me, it's about internalizing that text. This is video, Mark, um, of Sir Ian McKellen, 
breaking down, it's from the Royal Shakespeare Company, and he's breaking mm-hmm. down a Macbeth tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow uh, monologue. And it's so, it's so revelatory for me to see the, the depth to which he analyzes this text and how he looks at it in the rhythm, but he also looks at the, the imagery and how it talks about tomorrow, but he also talks about hereafter, and also talks about yesterday, so it's about eternal. And he talks about this huge breakdown of how he, how he dives into this text. Uh, and then he says, we don't do this, though, to show the audience, oh, look how smart I am. I know that it's about, it's an eternal because it says hereafter and to tomorrow and today. Uh, all it is is to, is to get, is to feel, is to know that you are in the role and the role is in you so that when you're on stage, you're at complete ease to just let whatever comes out, comes out because you're in, you're in the moment. If, I don't know. If that, I'm not sure that applies. I'm not sure that answers your question. No, you, I mean, you really have. Um, because a, a quality of you on stage is this incredible um, authenticity of the character. I mean, you really do inhabit the characters that you portray on stage. And you're, you're explaining how you get to that point of oneness with the character. Uh, so I, I certainly heard, also heard from singers that they kind of learn the music, learn the rhythms, learn the pitches, and then they add the words in. And I'm hearing you really starting with the words so that you know what you are saying before you begin to inflect it with music. If that is, that's definitely, and I know, you know, I, we all do it differently. So each singer, uh, I respect whatever process gets it to where it is. But for me, maybe I'm just a words person, but for me, it's very, it's integral. Uh, and it, it wasn't something I started doing in my career. It was something I came to later in life. And again, partly because when you have Gene Shear, uh, you know, uh, one, uh, I'm going to start singing Everest to you, but I'll, I'll spare you that. But like when you have, when you have the imagery that he gives and you're like, oh, there's the character. There's Beck Weather right there. I see it. I can, I mean, I can feel and taste. This is what he's talking about. Then. Um, it also gets you from worrying about, I don't know, like getting hung up on musical points. Like, oh, this tessitura is weird here, and I don't know how I'm going to take a breath there. And I think if I start there, then I'm already sort of anxious about how am I going to wind this up musically. Instead, it's like I'm comfortable in this role, and now that I'm comfortable and I have this foundation underneath me, I can figure out that the, mm-hmm. the music will learn it. Well, it won't learn itself, but you'll, the music will be able to be layered on top without some sort of uh, baked-in anxiety. Maybe. You talked a little bit about the, the dichotomy between new work and, and inherited repertoire, but you are someone um, who also does comedy and serious works and tragedies, and you, you go the emotional gamut. Um, and I'm curious, do you prepare differently for comedy versus tragedy? Is, is it a different approach that you take to the work? That's fascinating. I, I, it might be. I would say I um, like I am a clown, sort of like I'm a clown. I was a class clown uh, through life. I've been a uh, you name the class, and I was a clown. So I have the I have this innate desire to make people laugh, uh, and so uh, and hopefully a facility to do so as well. Uh, so it's approaching a comedic role. Um, I can almost. Well, you know, for one thing, you know, a lot of the comedy we do, a lot of the comedy, operatic comedy is rooted in commedia da okay? Mm-hmm. And so we have, a, I mean, this tradition that goes back to Venice in the 16th century. Um, don't, don't, don't Google that. I might be wrong. Something like that, uh, time-wise. And, and in that tradition, um, you can Google it, Mark, but the listeners, that might be wrong. Uh, but it, there's this deep tradition, and, and, you know, you have these Lazi. These, these bits that you can do, that this physicality that you can imbue. And so I've, I've done a, a lot of study of that physicality and then tried to make it my own, tried to figure out how, how my body works to make people laugh. Um, and so when I approach a comic role, I, uh, uh, it, like I sort of have a, I have a good sense of what I think I'm going to do physically. Um, right. But also it's, it, it, it's liber- there's a freedom there because I'm pretty confident that I can yeah, I can sort of figure out what's going to make people laugh and sort of go for it. Um, for more dramatic roles, it's, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not the same because the physicality isn't there, but it's more, it's, you know, it's, for me, for dramatic roles, I have to have all of that same intention of what I'm going to do, but I need to figure out a way to do it while standing still and how mm-hmm. to exude the, the point that I'm making without showing it, do it instead of show it. 
Um, and uh, it's a, it requires a little more concentration for me because as you can tell, as I bounce around the screen, uh, I like to move around, but it's, um, I have this, I, you know, there are a couple, I have, I have ways that I, uh, that I think about these. I, I, like for, uh, for instance, I just did Clagger at Central City uh, not too long ago. And like Clagger, you know, Clagger's a tortured soul. Um, and it was a delight because Central City is such an intimate theater. Right. And you could act, I could trust that my intention will get over the footlights, will get over the pit and get to the audience in part because it's such an intimate space. Um, but I, I do, I have a thought about the way I approach that sort of still uh, dramatic acting, which is an opera. I don't know as much for straight theater, but for an opera, the way I think we should deliver our text, or at least the way I need to deliver my text in a dramatic moment, uh, is with an implied, I need you to know beforehand. And so it's not just when he goes, I, John Claggart, master at arms upon the abdominal, have you in my power and I will destroy you. He's not just saying that. It's not just like downtown Frank Corsaro talking to, I don't know, talking to your father, talking to somebody that hurts you. Not that my dad ever hurt me, but, you know, like talking to whatever your issue is. Uh, you have to sort of push it beyond that. And for me, it's not just, I will destroy you. It's in your brain, you're thinking, I need you to know, I will destroy you. And that feeling of, I need you to know, is what gets me to mm-hmm. be grounded, to be mm-hmm. this tree that's just standing there, exuding, I need you to know, in front of and behind everything I say, in the hopes that that is enough energy and enough uh, it, that, that it propels it over the field light, and you can just exude it. Did, that make sense? Did, did this all come to you naturally? Did you study acting in a serious, focused way? I have studied it. No, I mean, this was stuff I sort of picked up over. I have studied acting uh, and I love to do, you know, I will. I actually teach uh, I, I teach an acting class now to the young artist in Atlanta Opera. Um, and I've done, you know, I, I teach the different techniques, the Suzuki, the Suzuki technique. And I teach um, uh, anyway, I, I, I like I've done sort of a deep dive in some of the techniques. But this is just something that over the course of time and, and talking, like talking to my friends, talking to my fellow, my fellow singers about what it is they do, picking people, being curious, being interested. Uh, and um, I, it's probably all wrong. It might be all wrong because it's, it's not rooted in study so much as in experience. Uh, the, pr- the, the proof but, is in the pudding. So uh, well, you're I, right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're good with that. Um, comedy and opera is hard because landing a joke, landing a laugh, depends on a whole lot more timing than does I love you, I love you, I love you. So um, do, you, do you recognize and just navigate through the complexity of, of that extra layer of timing in, in, in comedy? Yeah, I, I feel like, yes. And it's tough also with the timing, to your point, uh, that, you know, timing is a little more difficult when you have the train of the score going by. Like, you can't just, uh, in straight theater, you do the, the setup. Like, you know, even, like, you know, uh, Marcel and Marcel, you can do the setup, and you do the trip, you look back, you look out, and it's not like you don't have, it's been in a score. It really, it, it'll cook by, and you have to figure out how to cook it, how to, how to bake it into that train that's going. Um, I will say that it's, for me, the comedy uh, there's a, there's a saying um, I forget who said it, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, if 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 you if you are still on stage, what you're telling the audience is what I am doing now is more important than what I could be doing. And I feel like that applies both to dramatic, it was dramatic opera, but it also applies to comic opera. And if you look at the master buffos, uh, Corena and, and Capecchi, and I study with Paolo Montarsolo. Montarsolo they, and uh, Tom Hammond, one, a, a dear friend who, who recently passed, uh, the lessons you learn watching these gentlemen work, you realize it, you ha- I have this instinct of what I'm going to do, but if you want the bit to land, you have to clear enough space so the audience is looking and ready for you to do your boom, 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 and move on. Um, so within, about, the rigidity, within the rigidity of the score. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And so you have to, you have to sort of, and a lot of the, the, the hard part, like you said, is the rigidity, but the benefit is, especially in Rossini uh, or Donizetti, uh, Offenbach, uh, uh, Gilbert, like there's so much lighthearted comedy effervescent humor in the score 
that uh, it's, it's a nice trade-off, that if you have an actual lots of bit that you want to do, it's a little hard maybe, but, uh, you know, uh, patter into itself can be funny. And, the, and, like, the way they write these scores, you can hear the comedy in it, and so you can sort of let your body just go with the music, and that in and of itself is, uh, is, is going to get a laugh, most likely. Yeah, and we, we talk about it in our new works forum because there are so many new works, and it's really hard to find a comedy among all the new works. And yes. the difficulty, and the more you think about it, the more you realize what a genius Rossini was to be able oh. to create comic opera. And you've also, you know, oh, you need more rehearsal. You just, in order to get the timing, and as you say, to leave the space for the setup, within the rigidity of the score, it needs even more rehearsal than, than a, a, a tragedy which plays itself out uh, more easily. It's absolutely right. And in fact, I, I noticed, uh, you know, I did a fair amount of uh, operetta and co comic opera at Glimmerglass um, back when, uh, a, a while ago. Uh, and, um, you know, it does, you do like, you know, nine or 10 or 12, uh, but definitely not 11. I don't know why I skipped 11. 9, 10, 11, or 12 show performances of a run, and you realize, because every show, every show you show up early, and you run through the dialogue just to make sure it's in there, and by the fifth or sixth show, all of a sudden, everything comes into focus, and you realize, oh, we had an extra month to run these lines and to get used to each other and to just let it all sink in so that now all, all of the comedy that we've been looking for and trying to find just clicks in. The time with it. So, yeah. I mean, Pangloss in Candide or Clagger in Billy Bud, which, which is the true you? <laughs> I contain multitudes, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I would oh, say the comic, but I've got to say, you know, it's like for me, every uh, every high has a concomitant low, and I like to. I will turn it on, and I'm I'm uh, Ned Canty, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite collaborators uh, at Opera Memphis, an old friend, uh, claims that I that laughter to me. Uh, is a drug, right? and I just feed on it. Um, and so for me, it's I, I will. I probably have my instinct toward more toward Pangloss, but once that's over, and once I go home, I'm actually very. I I uh, I'm calm, and I don't know that I'm swagger. Like I do seed some, uh, but like I, I, I every every high that I get from laughing, I have that concomitant sort of stillness. So uh, and, and I would say probably a little more Pangloss. True of many people who are comedians that you know when they're done on stage there is that that moment of compensatory calm and and downness yeah absolutely you also do a lot of concert work and you know here we are talking about you and you know clearly you're you know a stage animal and I need that in a good way <laughs> um, but in concert work uh, you don't necessarily have a character you are just standing there singing a score the music without the character. Is that really challenging for you? It it is it is, uh, but it's also rewarding. Um, it's uh, in part because being I'm you know I'm sort of known as a singing actor. And listen, first things first, it's just nice to be known, right? So like I don't remember the old joke uh, that Peter Cazares used to say, but like there are there are used to tell me at least there are four maybe stages to to a career. It's who is Kevin Burdett? Uh, get me Kevin Burdett. Uh, get me someone like Kevin Burdett, and then who is Kevin Burdett? And so listen, <laughs> if you want, as long as I'm in the middle two, who is like, I'm fine. So I could be, I'm delighted to be known as a singing actor. But one thing that concert work brings is that allows me to just show off my singing. Uh, and for me, that's very rewarding to be able to show that, oh, I'm also, you know, I, that I can sing. I love singing Messiah. Uh, and in fact, Messiah is it may not be a perfect example because Messiah is such a story, and it's so. And Handel was, as you know, an opera composer, and so the way he wrote it, it's it's an operatic almost setting of a story. So it's uh, there is no set, there is no costume, but man, you're still selling that story. And for me, it's a nice sort of luxury every once in a while to be able to just to you know try to sh try to try to show off that I'm a good singer too, show off my musicality, and enjoy telling that story uh, vocally and telling the story through interpretation. Musical yeah, I guess any any time you are singing and singing words, if there are words, there's a story there. You know, I agree. If, if there are words, you know, there's got to be something behind those words. I I absolutely agree. I totally agree. Interesting. So let's talk yeah. about young artist programs. You uh, were at San Francisco Opera in the Merola Opera Program. Um, 
And then, interesting, you're at the uh, Opera de Na National de Paris in their Young Artist Program. So how did you wind up in the Young Artist Program in Paris? So you know, those, those two go hand in hand. I was, uh, so I was at Marilla in 98, I suppose, and Christine Bullen, who had run Marilla uh, in the 80s, and an incredible time in Marilla's history, you know, with, uh, I can't remember the topic, uh, Debbie Boyd and Carol Van Ness and Dolores Ivick and like these, uh, Nancy Gustafson, and I, and the list goes on and on of the amazing singers that came through Maryland back then. Christine had gone to Paris, um, right. and uh, so she was there, and she needed an extra base to do uh, a duo camara with Paolo Montorsolo. That's how I met him. And so she called up her friends at San Francisco Opera Center, and there were four of us that, that year, and so she came and auditioned us. Um, and then, you know, it was, I guess it was August, like maybe first or second week of August, and I was planning on going back to Juilliard, in two weeks, but she gave me the offer and I called up Juilliard and said, hey y'all, do you mind if I go do this for a year and then come back and finish up? Um, and it was an incredible experience, Mark. It was unreal. Being able to go, I worked for maybe two months straight with Paolo Montarsolo staging uh, Elixir of Love where uh, I was the dual camada. And so to be with Paolo every day, except for, you know, Sunday, whatever, like six days out of seven working with Paolo on um, Dua Camada, and there's one place that the words became so important because he would stop at any time in rehearsal and say, what are you saying right now? Uh, and one time I didn't know. It was, uh, oh my goodness, I can't remember what the words were. It was basically fresh off the presses in the beginning of Act Two. Uh, and I went, oh, uh, and just, oh, uh, and I didn't say it immediately. And he said, rehearsal though. There is no need for us to be here right now. If you don't know what you're saying, there is no need for us to be rehearsing. <laughs> Like, wow. I was mortified, but I also was inspired. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but you learn, I learned so much from Paolo. And it also, like, I, I have noticed since that uh, I do a fair amount of bufo. Uh, and there's a rich, there's a rich, there are some great bufos in this country. Um, I, I keep, I'll keep asking, I wanted to ask, who did I ask? Maybe it was Bill Madison or maybe it was Fred Cohn, someone. Uh, they should do an article called American Bufo. Because there's so many. You talk about John Del, John Del Carlo, who just passed, but you also have, Plitschka, and you have Tom Hammond, and you have Bill Travis, and you have Kevin Glad, and you have Peter Strummer, and then on down to this generation with Carpiz Patrick Carpizzi and me, we have these, it's a really, uh, there's a really strong mm -hmm. uh, lineage of American Bufo, and one thing I have found uh, uh, talking to the, to the uh, more experienced Bufo practitioners is they like it. They like to know that you have a school, and they like to know that I, that I study with Montarsolo, and even though what I do might look as much like Jim Carrey, uh, more like Jim Carrey than Mont Montarsolo. They know that I've studied Montarsolo and I respect the tradition. And I'm just trying to do that tradition in my own way, which Paolo 100% uh, endorsed, would have endorsed, in my opinion. I, I'm old enough to have seen his performances and they were just extraordinary. Just the body language, just, it was just yes. extraordinary. Um, but young artist programs in general, so a useful time to sort of test your, test your mettle? It's, it's invaluable, I think, Mark. Uh, uh, it, it, it's really, it truly is. I mean, it, it, it goes beyond. It's, a very, it's very useful, of course, to have a bridge between graduating uh, and going in and sort of jumping into the deep end uh, of, the, of the professional career. But it, it's an invaluable sort of, I don't know, liminal doesn't sound right, but like an invaluable media, sort of median space where, it's, uh, where you learn. Well, for one thing, you get on stage. And I think what... One, where one learns the most is through experience and being on stage. You learn how to follow a conductor. You learn how to throw the ball to your to your castmates and hope that the ball gets thrown back. Uh, and you, uh, you, it, you you learn how to juggle. I don't know in a protected in a protected space. Sort of, you get to learn. You get to work with amazing singers, and you get to. Um, what I think is, you sort of learn because you're still sort of a student. You're, you're a young artist. Uh, you learn, you, you understand that you still need to have the growth mindset, uh, which I take, there's a book I love called Thanks for the Feedback that talks about, that you need to, we need as singers, as people, and certainly as singers, we need to be prouder of our ability to grow. We need to be prouder of our ability to take feedback, to take notes, uh, than we are of our natural ability. Mm -hmm. So we need to be prouder of our ability to grow and become better and to accept the, the feedback than we are of how great we are. Uh, and that is an important step and that hopefully you keep that with you for the rest of your career. 
because as you come out of out of under out of a graduate school out of a conservatory generally you're one of the you, you're you, you're praised for your natural ability and you learn and you learn but you're praised for your natural ability and you need to know and the earlier the better and i think this is where i got this at the young arts program is you learn you got to have that growth mindset i've got to be i can't i've got to understand these notes are helping me become better and if i can take that note from Janine Rai, uh and and apply it then that is better than having known in the first place exactly guessing what she would have wanted, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I want to put that on the loop just to play it lots and lots. We are in the middle of our National Trustee Forum, and I've suggested to our trustees that learning is one of their fiduciary responsibilities, and that the process we have in the rehearsal hall, which is about rehearsal and coaching, um, it has to in inhabit every part of the opera enterprise, board, staff, artists that we all need to be open to those notes that make us better when we go on stage tomorrow. Yeah. Amen. I, I Amen. More. Now, you deferred Juilliard for a year when you went to Paris. I did. But you deferred Columbia University for six years <laughs> in terms of going to six law years, school. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> we are aware that you are lead a double life um, as comedian and tragedian, uh, but here as <laughs> as singer and lawyer. So why did you apply to law school? So I was an undergrad. I was actually dead set on becoming an attorney. Uh, I was pre-law. I was in a program that was more or less pre-law. I worked on the Hill in, in D.C. and was really, I, that's what I thought I was going to do. Uh, but then I took a year after my junior year of undergrad, I took, uh, I took a year abroad and went to Vienna. And in Vienna, I ended up studying at the Hochschule of Musik uh, took voice lessons, gotten a couple shows, uh, and I'll probably most importantly was at the Stasova on average maybe twice a week. And the the stay plus the standing room only at the Stasova was about three bucks at that time, and a movie would have been maybe ten bucks. And so for me, and you know, music is the lifeblood of Vienna. So if you're going to be in Vienna, go to the state, go to the state theater. So I was at the Stasova so often, and I, that's why I sort of fell in love with uh, telling stories with music. Um, so when I returned back to finish up my undergrad, uh, I decided I'd apply to grad school and law school. I was always going to apply to law school. So I thought, well, maybe I'll apply to grad school too. And Juilliard so you, deferred so you, and Columbia. You applied to both. You applied to both. I applied to both. And so Columbia deferred. Uh, the, the dean of admissions uh, was a guy named James, a gentleman named James Millian. Uh, and he uh, liked opera. And he liked the fact that I was going for it. So. He ended up letting me defer initially for two years and then an extra year for Paris. Then I started singing at City Opera. And then he just, for six years, I deferred. And, and did he finally call the question and say, okay, you need to, <laughs> you need to come to law school? Or had you somehow had a, had a moment of questioning the operatic career that made you go back to law school? The latter. Uh, I was doing, uh, I, well, I was on a stretch of doing, uh, you know, gigs. I was doing, I was doing um, sort of regional work, doing a bunch of Mozart. And I realized at one point that I wasn't as happy as maybe I could be. And I started to focus on the negative aspects of the career. Um, and I realized maybe I'm focusing on the negative aspects of the career, uh, n not because there's so many of them, but because I have this other tariff sort of calling me over there. And so because I have this other option beckoning me, I tend to dwell yeah, maybe I'm dwelling on the aspect that I don't like as much, being on the road too much, uh, too much and not being able to be with the person I was dating at the time and sort of yeah. all that. Uh, so I said, to be happy, I probably need to go figure out if my first interest uh, is actually what I should be doing. So I called up Dean Milligan and said, are you sitting down? Uh, I would like to, I, I will be there in the fall. And I called, then I called Robin Thompson and uh, Paul Kellogg and told them, um, uh, sorry to say this, but is it possible that I can uh, withdraw from the contract next year? And they were, they were gracious. Paul said, Paul said I, I'm on my third career right now. I, I respect that. And if you ever come back, you always, have, you always have a place at my opera, which I'm going to start crying. <laughs> Paul, was, Paul one, of the, one of the gracious men in our business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's yeah. just wonderful. So you then... It wasn't in your first year of law school or your second year of law school or your third year of law school, but you actually, where, where you thought, well, no, I want to go back to opera. You, you finished law school at Columbia, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a great law degree. 
you know, there are some important Supreme Court justices who went to Columbia Law School. Um, and uh, you started a law firm, at a big law firm. I sure did, yeah. It was, uh, it's funny you mentioned that about Columbia, but Columbia was an interesting, a great experience for me. I had a wonderful experience there, in part because I was, at, again, talking about Paul, uh, I started at Columbia in the fall of 2003, and in the summer of 2003, I was doing a Hoffenbach piece of uh, Bluebeard at Glimmerglass, and uh, Justice Ginsburg and, back, and Marty and the whole, whole family would go up to Glimmerglass every summer, uh, and so Paul facilitated my meeting them after, uh, after one of the Bluebeard performances, and I met Jane Ginsburg, who is a professor at Columbia now. She's one of the, right. inter, one of the gurus of, of copyright in the world. Yeah. And so I met Jane there, and then when I arrived for, um, for you know, orientation at law school, a couple of weeks later, the D, I forget, the, one of the people who was running orientation said, oh, you're Kevin Burdett. Uh, Professor Ginsburg said, you should have this packet. And so she then ended up being her research assistant. I took her classes, of course. Uh, I helped her um, edit case books. And so she sort of shepherded me through, through law school, which was a uh, huge honor, of course, and also very helpful. Uh, and I did, I, I took some semesters off at law school to sing, to sort of work my way through law school. And upon graduation, I uh, went to work at a big firm in New York, Devil Boys and Plimpton, uh, where Sherwin used to be a, 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 a speaking of Bill uh, Oh, I, I, know, I, maybe I, 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 didn't know, I didn't know that connection. That's a good connection. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sherwin had a practice there. And, uh, and then I worked for a couple of years, about two and a half years, as a corporate, uh, a corporate associate at Devil Boys and Plimpton. So when did you decide, decide that, okay, this isn't for me? And, and it had to have been a, you know, a big fork in the road because you were probably making more as a third-year lawyer at a big firm than you were as an opera singer. And the potential financial rewards and lifestyle if you had gone on versus the peripatetic um, <laughs> and lower-paying lifestyle of an opera singer what was that decision matrix like? So it was, yeah. So fortunately, Devil Voice, they, they call it a, a lifestyle firm, which is a bit of a misnomer at the big firm. Uh, but among those white shoe firms, it's the one that, that would allow you to take a leave of absence to go to a gig. So um, I, I did a leave of absence to go down to Buenos Aires to do an, uh, an abduction from Australia at Teatro Colón. Uh, and, uh, or what should say, with Teatro Colón. The, the actual Teatro Colón wasn't open from the right. renovation yet. Um, and then I did a, a another leave of absence to go sing uh, at the Met, do my Met debut. And after doing those two, I know, those two gigs, um, I thought about it, and I said, you know, I, I did not dislike being an attorney. Um, I thought I, was, I had a, a nice niche. Uh, I had a good a couple of mentors, a partner mentors, that were sort of uh, shaping my career. Um, I had a lot of great experiences, but at the end of the day, I thought, you know, I'm going to be happier, uh, I think. Uh, I, having those experiences in direct contrast, going to the Met, going to Buenos Aires, which you got traveling internationally, and then the pressure of being at the Met, uh, I was like, this is still, even with the possible negative aspects that I had been focusing on, I, this is just more rewarding being on stage. So, I, uh, I it, it, but it, but your point is well taken. That is, it, the arc of being on partner track and even being a really successful opera singer was never, I mean, it's never going to line up. Uh, but for me, I feel like um, it, what I needed, for one thing, I was fortunate at the law firm because I had, at Columbia, I didn't actually always take the hardest courses at Columbia. One of the courses I took was the anatomy of a large law firm. And so we talked about how to survive in a law firm. And one thing it talked about was not getting the golden handcuffs. Like when you are when you become an associate, don't just then go get a five thousand dollar a month apartment because you all have a big salary. Like just you don't want to be stuck. And so I stayed at my I sublet half of an apart half of a rent controlled apartment in Washington Heights uh, from a friend of mine, an older woman. And so I just kept doing that throughout the whole time at Devil Boys. So I had you know I was able to pay off my debts when I was practicing, and I was able to sort of build up a little bit of cushion. Um, and I had a couple of gigs lined up. And I would say that the analysis really, so one of my favorite authors is Brene Brown, um, one of my favorite speakers and thinkers of Brene Brown. Uh, uh, her book, Daring Greatly, is, is uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, and in it, is she says, if we want to uh, sort of get away from perfectionism 
we have to make the long journey from what will people think to I am enough. And it was very important for me at that time to think uh, I am enough. Like I, it, it, I, if I go back to opera, I think I will have enough. I don't need to have, I don't need to be rewarded uh, uh, financially on this, on the trajectory that I get from the law firm. I need to embrace the fact that I am enough and this will be enough. It, it rings a little hollow right now in COVID because um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, my friends who are singers and who have spouses who are singers and have nothing is all of a sudden we, maybe we don't have enough. But at that time in 2009, 2010, I had to stop lined up and I said, I need to, and the perfectionism aspect isn't perfect, but it's like, I need to make, I need to, I mean, I need to make the journey from what people think to I am enough. I need to not, I need not to judge. I need not to base my success on what other people would define as success. I need to know that I'm enough. It's br just that brilliant. Just said, you know, Kevin, that's brilliantly said. And you're so wise to have gone through your years as a, an associate that way. I do get calls, not infrequently, from people who are seventh, eighth year associates. They're maybe they've made partner, but now that the student loans are paid off, they want to have a job in opera administration because they love opera. And I said, you know, are you ready to take a seventy percent pay cut? You know, and right. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not willing to make that. They want to go from, you know, young partner in a law firm to the top of an opera company. It just doesn't work that way. So you're so smart in the way you handled that. Um, but I, I just find it astonishing that while you were at Columbia Law School, you were still performing some, that you would take a leave from the law firm to make your Metropolitan Opera debut. That's just, I mean, it's just a crazy story, but really. <laughs> now, um, there was another benefit to the law firm. Oh yes, the biggest benefit, and the one that the, for the rest of my life is my. I met my wife at the law firm. Uh, also, so, an, an attorney as well. She is an attorney. Yep, she was. So I was doing commercial real estate, uh, which was uh, at Debevoise at least was not exactly the glamour uh, group to be in. She was doing uh, fund formation, where you know private equity and hedge fund formation. That was the glamour group to be in at, at Debevoise. So she was the uh, she's. Definitely the smart one, um, but I was, yeah. So I, I met Natalia there. How wonderful. She had sense. So then I left to go back to be an opera singer, uh, and she, not long after, thought, well, that seems like a good way, a better way to approach life maybe than, uh, uh, well, not again, she loved me. She was great at the firm, but she uh, went back and pursued one of her first passions, which is education. So she grew up, she grew up in Brooklyn, uh, went to, um, went to public school in, in, uh, in, in, in Brooklyn and sort of it was education that sort of was her, that got her to where she was. And uh, so she went from Devil Voice to go to be uh, in-house counsel at uh, an education not-for-profit, Teach for America. How fantastic. Isn't that great yeah. that you both uh, pursued what really mattered? Uh, Absolutely. You have, two, you have two children. We do. I have a daughter, Isla, who's six, uh, and a son, Edison, who's two. Isla is a performer also. She was Dolore. She was Trouble in Madame Butterfly at Central City and loved that experience. And also here at Knoxville, Knoxville Opera, she was, uh, she was the star of a Knoxville Opera. Well, she covered it at Santa Fe Opera. Rad Woolbright thought one day, you know what? I think Isla is old enough to cover this. And so Brad started, he created a monster, frankly. Not the first time Brad's done that. So when you go, when you do your opera gigs, which we will be returning to soon, when you do your opera gigs, do you travel with a child under each arm? Do you bring them with you? <laughs> as much as possible. Um, now that Isla has started school, it's more difficult. Before, up until Isla started school, so I traveled with the family, which is, um, I find it very rewarding on multiple levels, uh, in part because it, it informs my time in whatever city I'm in. Like sometimes, you, like before I had children, I would be in a city – um, like I was like, uh, maybe I was doing a gig in Philadelphia and what I would end up doing is I go to rehearsal and then maybe I get a cheesesteak and, uh, then I go back to the hotel room and, um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of necessarily, uh, become a part of the fabric of the city. But when I'm there with Isla, uh, I go to rehearsal and then we go to the Liberty Bell and then we go to Constitutional Hall and then we go to the club statue and we go to the Museum of Art, the barn. 
Uh, and the next thing you know, it's like I am now a part. I am part of the city, and I'm not choosing Philadelphia is a good one because Philadelphia Opera is so much a part of its city. It's such a part. Like the mission is, it's not just an opera company in Philadelphia. It's Philadelphia the opera, and so you realize somehow it informs your. It informs what you're doing and uh, uh, how you're telling that story on the on the academy stage to be a part of the environment that you're in. You feel the you feel the ground, the terroir. You feel the it, it informs how you how I perform. And on the flip, it means that uh, everything just doesn't kind of blend together for the kids too. Like I remember where we like I remember the first time I started to crawl. It was in Milwaukee. I was singing with Florentine Opera. And there she goes crawling across the floor, which I but I mean, I'd re probably remember that if we were just in our apartment in New York, but it would, doesn't blend together. But we have very distinct memories of what happened where. When did you move to Atlanta? We moved in 2016. Okay. We had, uh, I had just turned two. We had a uh, one bedroom up in Washington Heights. Uh, and we just, we had outgrown it and started looking around. And Natalia is from, like I said, she's from Brooklyn. So she's a New Yorker. Uh, we looked around and we just realized financially uh, it made more sense uh, to leave for us to leave that area. Um, and so it was actually, I did a whole bit. I was doing, you know, any gig we go to, I'd say, well, what about this city? And we, mm -hmm. there were so many, uh, I, we, I did a gig in Atlanta. It was the middle of February. It was springtime. I got there straight for Philadelphia where it was a foot and a half of snow. And Natalia was like, how about Atlanta? And I have family there. My sister lives there. It's not too far from where my mom lives in Tennessee. Uh, it's a great, a great airport. airport. Exactly. They got a great airport. Um, yep. Tell us about the Atlanta Opera Company players. Oh, what a great, yeah, that's a great experience. Um, so um, the company players, is, it's amazing. It was, you know, obviously Atlanta Opera, like all opera companies, had plans for this season, uh, for this, you know, for the 2021 season that uh, went sideways uh, with the arrival of COVID. And so um, Tomer, Came up with this idea of starting of creating a company players, which consisted mostly of people that are in Atlanta or near Atlanta, and we would be. It's a little bit like a test contract, sort of. Uh, and we would. It's it, it sort of ties. Speaking of community ties and offer to the community, it's sort of. There's a rich. There's a bevy of great singers in Atlanta, maybe in part because of the airport. Um, and so to use these the local singers and the Georgian singers and the people who grew up near Atlanta as a group of singers that would then put on uh, plays in this big, uh, you talked about, as you heard probably yesterday, uh, um, in the, the Big Ten series where we did socially distanced and very uh, rigidly uh, safety protocol uh, performances, but it's with friends of mine in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, it's it, like I mentioned, uh, um, my first opera, got went and I saw my friend Ed Patrick on stage uh getting my friends like it's the the community i think responded uh beautifully to this to the big tent series because there are these are our friends on stage so it's not like you are you know a bubble you know in the in covid terms um that um you know that that you perform I and mean, you live your lives but you are local so you don't have to be in hotels you don't have to go through airports but you are Absolutely. local and can perform for the company in a variety of repertoire because there are so many good singers. Uh, so it's kind right. of a local identity of a cluster of singers. That's absolutely right. Um, everything you said is on the nose. And we had uh, every week we'd be tested uh, to make sure everything was good. And we had, if anything, if there was a chance, there was an exposure event. And so we moved. So everything shifted. Um, it was, it was, but yeah, it, that's, that's exactly what it is. And right now we're doing more uh, in the winter season. Uh, we're also, um, working on producing digital content for the spotlight media at Atlanta opera. And it's just a blast for me because it's frankly, these like, we're talking, these are friends of mine that have no fears, Alex Schrader and Daniela Mack, two of my, two of the best singing actors alive live in Valdosta, Georgia, and they are company players. And Jamie Barton, the literal singer of the world, um, is, is she's from Rome, Georgia. She lives in Atlanta now. Um, I had, I had not realized this in 2013 when Jamie won singer of the world, the runner up was Daniela Mack. Yeah. So we have, it's unbelievable. These are company players, Morris Robinson, like the Morris Robinson. And I, I, think more, I think other companies are looking at developing this sort of cluster of local singers if they're able to, because it does provide some level of safety through the current COVID crisis of 
no hotels, no airplanes, you get to stay at home, uh, it, it all makes sense. But how, how have you been through the COVID crisis? I, I mean, lots of projects just canceled, contracts canceled. How's it been for you? You know, it's been disappointing and I'm a little, um, I'm kind of Pollyanna, I guess. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but I keep thinking, oh, this next one will come through uh, and it never does. Uh, and so it, it, it's a little disillusioning. Um, you know, there were, there were a couple world premieres I was going to do that went away, and I'm not sure the rescheduling. One has been rescheduled where I can do it, but the other one I can't do the world premiere because the rescheduled one I can't do it. And so that's disappointing. Um, I did a, uh, uh, I was going to do this Maratolo in Dallas, which was going to be amazing for me because one of the previous Bartolos, I guess two Bartolos ago in North Figaro in Dallas, was Paolo. And so Paolo Dorsolo. And so I was going to be, like, for me, that was going to be incredible. And I don't know that that's going to happen. It might. I don't know. I don't. That's way above my pay grade. Um, but, you know, it's also been nice. Like, I think when it, when all is said and done, I will look back on this time and realize it was, uh, I, I will realize that it's been a really great time for me to spend time with my family. Um, and also, I mean, that period. So we need to spend time with my family. That's been an, an invaluable gift. Um, uh, and also, there one of my favorite quotes uh, is from Mary Oliver, poet Mary Oliver, uh, who says, "Instructions for living a life: Pay attention, be astounded, tell about it." And for me, that's the way we are. That's what opera singers need to do. We need to pay attention. We need to be astounded, and we need to tell about it. And unfortunately, when we're fortunately or on, when when in, in pre-COVID times, it was a lot of going from tell about it to tell about it to tell about it to tell about it. And we didn't spend a whole, I didn't spend enough time on the pay attention and on the be astounded. And so right now I'm sort of enjoying, I'm leaning into the paying attention and the being astounded and figuring out, you know, when I did uh, uh, Kaiser for Atlantis in, in, uh, and with, with the company players in Atlanta, this is an incredible piece that has so many layers and it's just 60 minutes, but it has all this depth to it. And if you have the time to do that dive, it's all the more rewarding to find out that Ullmann, uh, Ullmann who, had been a, who had studied to be an attorney in Vienna, um, his, his, his fascination with the duality of time, the sort of the, the, the tension, the paradox between the duality between uh, the, the temporal time and eternal time and how, how you can use, uh, how, and talking, it's so applicable to Ullmann's uh, life, uh, to his uh, being in Theresienstadt, but it's also, uh, it's applicable to, to our time, this sort of tension of, of what is eternal and what is the material burden? How do we shut out the material burden of today? Uh, and he looked to form and he looked to structure to do that. He, his structure was writing music. The form he looked to to survive Theresian shot psychologically was by composing. He was much more prolific in Theresian shot than he had been prior because he had that. And so for us to see this, this big tent on this Oglethorpe field, it's a, a literal manifestation of form. And for us to have these performances, these rehearsals, and for an audience to be able to come to a performance and have this structure and how that is, it makes life more, uh, it, it, it ties into the eternal uh, more than the, ten anyway, I'm rambling on, but you get the point. Hopefully, yeah. I don't know, maybe you don't. You know, I'm, I'm so sorry for all of the lost performances that you've done. Thrilled to hear about uh, what you've been doing with Atlanta Opera. And I just love the idea of the company players that's been put together. Um, but it's been, it's been a, a season of some disappointments, even as you talk about the wonderful opportunity to spend more time with your children and with your wife. Um, so I have a last question. We'll, we'll end on an up note. What is drunk opera? <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, one of the things... <laughs> Um, there's this also Herbie Hancock has this story where he used to, uh, you know, Herbie Hancock plays Miles Davis. Uh, and he said one time they were playing along and all of a sudden in the middle of a solo, he hit this chord that he's just like, Oh, that's the wrong chord. That's the wrong chord. I, I can't believe I just did that. Uh, and Miles stopped, kind of looked at him and then started playing and he played some notes that were, that made that chord make sense. And Herbie Hancock said that is, that for him was a lesson as a musician, but it was also a lesson in life that, uh, you take whatever is in front of you. And you figure out how to make how to be constructive. You take it as a, it is what it is. That chord was there, and it's not a mistake. It is my present situation. Now, how do I make my present situation make sense? How do I make it more constructive? One of the things 
that my manager, who's really worked so hard, he's done an incredible job uh, keeping me sane as we try to line things up that keep falling down, was by creating a streaming series, uh, Fletcher Artist Management and Entertainment, where we, we sort of pivoted to doing storytelling over video. And one of my ideas was, um, you know, we have Drunk History. It's this great series about people who might be a little inebriated telling story, telling the story of history. And then uh, uh, I, for a long time, I've talked to friends about how great would it be if we could have a drunk opera and have someone get a little tipsy and tell the story of an opera. Uh, and hey, no better time than the present. We're not doing anything else. So uh, uh, that was, <laughs> so we did a, a, a drunk history version of Honor of the Regiment, which was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was funny or not, but it was enjoyable. <laughs> Do you, have, do you have some more coming down the pike at us? Oh, well, I, I have passed that off to I, who I think is, um, I think Steve Osgood from Chautauqua Opera. I keep thinking he should do one because he's, you know, he knows his, he knows his uh, poodles and he knows his opera. Yeah, I suggest it's so, later, Mel. So true. Uh, Kevin, <laughs> you know, it, it is such a pleasure to get to know you this way because when we see one another in the Opera Center in New York, it's, we're in an elevator going up and down seven floors. We don't have a chance yeah, to talk yeah. like this. Um, I, I so admire you as an artist. I knew I would admire you as a human being. And this conversation just shows what a thoughtful, considerate, generous man you are. So I just want to thank you for being with us. Thanks for sharing your insights into life and into your career. And I just can't wait to see you on stage again, hopefully this summer in Santa Fe. Um, yes, sir. Fingers crossed. And I yep. just say, you know, Godspeed and, and hug your children for us tonight. Amen. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. It's just, uh, I'm honored beyond words. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. You take care. Bye -bye. You too. Thank you.